Hi everybody, I'm DJ Sixsmith. Welcome to Sit Down. We've got a very special guest in the building. It's Wynn Hanman. Wynn, how are you? I am feeling very well and hope to stay that way. Well, it is great to have you. First of all, I'm glad to hear you're feeling better, that you're out of the hospital. So first yes, and foremost, you have good health. I was in a hospital for pneumonia. When you're 97 with pneumonia, they, they get a little nervous. Just a little bit, yeah. But somehow I... Uh, I seem to be pulling out of it, and I'm very happy to be with you. Well, it's great to have you. So I saw the film, It Takes a Lunatic, um, and it, I loved it. I you mean, did? you have this amazing theater story. You've touched so many different lives, and we were just talking off camera. You don't seek publicity. It, no. it comes to you. So how cool was it to see this whole film made and just to go back and, and remember some of the past times? Well, it's a pleasure to remember him because I had a, a happy career. And, uh, of course, I had problems, uh, anyone would. But uh, it's been uh, a rich experience, and I've been very fortunate. And I say fortunate because you're lucky if you can live as long as I have. I'm going on 97 in a couple of weeks. Wow. I'll be 97 God years bless. old. And I had my own theater for many decades in New York City that was built for me and the American Place Theater, and um, I've been uh, rewarded very well. I have no complaints. That's awesome to hear. So mm -hmm. when you think about yourself as a young man, what do you remember about theater, and who were some people that inspired you back in the day? Uh, insp I didn't go to theater. I grew up playing stickball, right. baseball. Yeah, you were out there on the streets. Up in Manhattan. Yeah. And... Uh, it was all very, I never thought about, the, my parents say, oh, come downtown and see Showboat. Mm. Uh, uh, showboat or some Broadway show when I was a kid. I, I don't want to leave Inwood. Inwood was my borough, my place. The Manhattan is the borough. But Inwood section uh, is upper Manhattan. Uh, it was all woods then. And I had a country boyhood in uh, Manhattan because when I was a child, we lived on a dirt road in Manhattan. Wow. That's <laughs> a mu much different place. time. Yeah. And the, right across the street, across Broadway, was woods where we sleigh ride and did things like that. And uh, uh, that became Fort Tryon Park where I spent a lot of time. But we always had Inwood Hill Park north in uh, around 207th Street, uh, Inwood Hill Park, I think it's still rural. I don't get around that much to, <laughs> to be there, but there was an Indian reservation there, and uh, it was woods. Yeah. And we were with squirrels and <laughs> uh, various animals. But the upper Manhattan was quite rural when I was a child. Yeah, much different than it is today. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's altogether different. Definitely. So thinking about your theater, you, you had so many incredible students. You put on wonderful shows. What are some things that still stick with you all these years later? Well, there were a lot of high points I will have to Definitely. claim. Definitely. Yeah, uh, let, let's hear them. Come high on. High points. Well, the, the, one of the very highest points was a play by Robert Lowell, who was America's leading greatest, greatest poet of that time. And he wrote a play called The Old Glory, which consisted of three parts, a triptych, and each part was based on a, a great writer's, uh, American writer, as uh, work like Hawthorne. We had um, my kin Endicott and the Red Cross, mm -hmm. and my kinsman Major Molyneux, and uh, with uh, Mel uh, Herman Melville. We had the Old Glory, uh, Benito Serino, and these were drawn on by America's greatest living poet, who was a Lowell of Massachusetts, mm. where the Lowells only talked to the Cabots and that right. stuff. But he was a Lowell right, with American, important American, significant American ancestry, such as the poet Amy Lowell, and uh, he wrote these plays, which were uh, formidable because if you did them all, and we did them all, they were over four hours. And if you had wow. a cast 
they were uh, in nearing the hundreds because the, the, the largest of the plays was Benito Sereno, which was on a slave ship that had revolted against the Spaniards who were transporting them. So you had to have uh, at least uh, 50 people who could play slaves mm. on it, and they had nothing to do with the rest of the cast who was Spanish. And then my kinsman Major Molyneux was a New England American, uh, as was Endicott and the Red Cross. But anyway, that's, to me, I had uh, the great treasure with those plays. And I opened the theater with them, mm. which was crazy. Uh, it was part of what my lawyer had said, it takes a miracle to have a not-for-profit theater, which was kind of new at that time, and certainly in the Greenwich Village in New York. And uh, that size cat. But I was so fortunate as to be able to do those plays. But then there was immediately a great play called Harry Noonan Night mm -hmm. by a totally unknown writer, Ronald Ribman, yeah. and two unknown actors, one Joel Gray in the lead, and the other in the lead, a guy named Dustin Hoffman. You may have heard of him, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dustin Hoffman, since I had my theater, was in a church, which was something new too. It was a moribund church which came to life because we would be able to put the life of the American Place Theater into it and bring audiences. And it still was a, functioned on Sundays as a church because my co-director was a priest, mm, Sidney wow. Lanier, uh, de descended from the American poet Sidney Lanier, a Southern poet, and a relative of uh, a man named Tennessee Williams, mm whose original name was Thomas Lanier Williams. Yeah, that's right. And um, they were related, and he was on the first board. And uh, so a high point was Harry Noonan Knight, and then uh, La Teresa, the first full-length play by Sam Shepard, which I loved, mm. and Sam was given the right to not have critics if he didn't want him. It's okay with me. We didn't have it. A lot of criticism. And then one of my old time, I have, you see, I'm like, a, I'm a father with children. <laughs> I don't have favorites. They're my children. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm you proud love them of all, all equally, of them. right? And one of them was Hogan's Goat. Mm. Now, here's Hogan's Goat by a professor from Harvard, and it's written in blank verse. There's no, I don't think there are any other American plays that have been done that are written in blank verse. Uh, blank verse, ba 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 ba. Great speeches. Mm. Uh, I mean, just some of the speech. Uh, he's an Irish American uh, immigrant, and he came over, and he's bound for the American success. And his, <coughs> he brought over an Irish woman, who complains that um, she's not where she should be. She feels alien. She says, uh, I feel like an alien here in this country. She came from Lace Curtain Irish mm -hmm. in Dublin. And he says, are you the only exile of us all? Mm. I crossed the, through in a rose, you crossed in a rose road birth. I, and, and it's beautiful, just an example of uh, Shakespearean iambic pentameter being put to very good use. And so that, and uh, Irene Fornes, mm -hmm. a wonderful uh, play, a New York playwright, and a play called, uh, uh, I can't think of it. Oh, you I got some good ones there. I may yeah. lose titles. No, you're good. Uh, I can't. Uh, anyway, uh, Pfeffer and her friend. Yep, yep. Wonderful play. Uh, and they all just pop out. I mean, I had, Rubbers and Yanks, Three Detroit, Nothing, Top of the Seven mm. by Jonathan Reynolds, yeah. uh, which uh, I didn't seek hits, but I didn't fight it when I got <laughs> a hit. I had an audience. Absolutely. And, and I could run it all summer, and I did. And uh, so then I'm, I'm, you've attracted a lot of 
I had a subscription only theater for mm -hmm. 13 years. Yeah, it's incredible. Crazy. Incredible. And incredible. But there it was, and I sustained it uh, as long as I could. Um, but then others came in and had box office, and then uh, that I had to do it for, I only did it 13. So those were a lot of high points, and uh, I mean, I did a lot of plays, yeah. and to me, they're all high points. Uh, the one called Isidore Duncan Sleeps with the Russian Navy, and then uh, that was right lifted from Isidore Duncan's autobiography, and uh, then there was, um, I've had many others. But yeah, on and on we could go, no, but those, go. those are a great lists. I your whole program <laughs> with, the, with the number of plays I did, but those are some of the ones that pop out at this moment. I like it, I like it. So let's talk about some of those children, as you called them. Yeah. Let's talk about Dustin Hoffman, because in the film you said he was tough to direct and produce. So he was. what do you remember about teaching him? Dustin, he had to have his way and you couldn't budge him. Mm except his way turned out to be brilliant, right. but he drove you crazy <laughs> on the way. You know, many great artists will do that to you. And uh, if you are in the position I was in, you have to tolerate it. But if you meet Dustin, Dustin he'll tell you that uh, how unhappy I was with him, but when he produced his, finally, I learned that let him alone, he'll come up with it. And when he does, it's brilliant. Yeah. So he had two brilliant performances, one in Harry Noon and Night. And he played some kind of crazy uh, uh, snake-like German dwarf. I mean, it was a nutty character. And then um, another play um, he did was The Journey of the Fifth Horse. That also pops out at me. Mm. I won all the OBs. I won a lot of OBs. Yeah, you were quite successful. I yeah. won a lot of OBs. But The Journey of the Fifth Horse, which Ronald Ribman brilliantly uh, drew from, he didn't adapt. There's a Turgenev Diary of a Superfluous, superfluous Man, Diary of a Superfluous Man, who um, into a, a play called The Journey of the Fifth Horse which had uh, Dustin Hoffman in one of the leading roles and a close friend of mine, Michael Tolan, who's deceased, uh, in uh, the other role, Chalka Turin. Anyway, I had many, many high points of theater, which uh, m more than my share, but I, I got them. <laughs> And performances that pop out. Frank Langella, who had been my student, mm -hmm. he was a, one of the leads in The Old Glory, yeah. along with a wonderful actor, Roscoe Lee Brown. And uh, I mean, that was such a high point. They won Obies. Um, <clears throat> great performances. Uh, How about Michael Douglas? You talk about Michael him in the Douglas? film. Michael Douglas? Yes. You were going to tell his mom that he was great. I thought that was a really interesting part. What, what prompted you to think about that He surprised me when I told him. <laughs> well, you see, he was very young yeah. when he studied with me. Uh, young, I don't know, maybe 20 years old. And um, I knew his parents. And it was his parents who sent them to me. He had gone to, uh, he had gone to prep schools. I don't know the names, mm -hmm. but the fancy prep schools. And his, the man who married his mother was Bill Darrod, who uh, he wasn't the, Michael's father, but like a father mm -hmm. to him. We, we know who Michael's father yep. is. <laughs> yeah, Kirk Douglas. Yep. Yeah, Kirk Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, he... Um, he was a student that, so Bill Darrett, I knew, I had acted in summer stock in Olney, Maryland in 1947, mm -hmm. and he was a fellow actor. But 
later on, uh, I mean, Sanford Vines, the most important. No wind handman without Sanford Meisner, yeah. a truly great teacher. What'd you learn from him? <laughs> Everything. Well, I, I learned a lot from him, enough to get me started, right. and then I learned from myself. So I'm a combination of Sanford Meisner and Wynne Hanman mm. as a teacher. I didn't replace him, I just grew out of him. And he always championed me, got me jobs, when I, uh, when I was, uh, when I, when I you had out, a right? child, when yeah. my first child was born, mm -hmm. and I was teaching at the neighborhood playhouse, I said, "Look, I can't support a family now, uh, and so I, I need a larger salary from the neighborhood playhouse where I'm teaching." He said, "Well, I'll get you started on the classes." because more people want to study with me than I can handle, and I'm going to recommend you to be my replacement in terms of getting into the class. And he did that, and that's what got me started. But to get back to Michael Douglas, mm -hmm. so this was this young actor who Bill Darren and his mother sent to me, and, oh, he did beautiful work in class. I mean, he just had imagination, he had personality, he had the looks, and a real affinity for theater and imagination. And I gave him one play, uh, an early one actor by John Guare, which I can never figure out, <laughs> but I thought it'd be good for actors to work on. I gave it to him, and uh, he came up with the most charming performance. Anyway, he, was, he did exceptionally well. And, he was among my youngest students, yeah. and I happened to know his parents. So I don't remember doing that, but he told me. Right. He said, so you said, uh, is it all right if I tell your mother how good you are? <laughs> I'm sure that was important for him. It was. Yeah. Because he, he said, and it's on, I think, in, uh, the, in the film, the yeah. of entry, that he gained confidence. Yes. And that is a, one of the most important things in acting teacher can give you confidence because you need confidence to go out there in that world definitely of competition of cutthroats of commercialism uh, and you want a career but I felt he could have a career so what happened was uh, he he got a, he was in class for some time then as most of the actors do they migrated to California because that's where the work is. Right. Well, just as he migrated to California, I had a play called Pinkville mm -hmm. by George Tabori, who wrote The Cannibals, which was, oh, if you talk about high points, The Cannibals. That's a good one. one. The high points of my production. Yeah. Well, he had, authored, he had authored The Cannibals, and now this was his next play. And it was during the Vietnam War, and uh, it was just following the My Lai Massacre. Mm. And it had this young person in the lead uh, as a soldier, a Vietnam-American soldier. And so he, something's hit, hitting my arm, but nobody's hitting it. <laughs> anyway, uh, he, um, all, sometimes I get an E-day fix mm -hmm. on what I say. I'm only going to do this play unless I get this actor. Yeah, that's important. And they don't have to be stars. Right. No one ever heard of Michael Douglas. <laughs> so I said, but he just went to California, and flying back and forth from California at that time was not as prevalent or easy as right. it is right now. So I said, well, he just went to California. But I'm telling you, I told to George Tabori, the playwright, and Michael Freed, the director, that he, uh, he's the one for the part. Because he's just the, our youth, you know, the new youth were being drafted. He was a perfect example, and he had everything going. Uh, so I said, I want to do it with him. He, I'm not, he's not going to come here to audition. And we're not paying for him to come to audition. Take my word for it. He's it. And uh, they did. 
Wow. And oh, he came in, he, he, he auditioned, they okayed him. You had to okay him. He right. was wonderful. You're going to be speaking on a panel with him coming up pretty soon. That's right. I'm doing a panel with him now on a documentary called... Uh, it Takes, it a, takes lunatic. a Lunatic. And, and that's you. Uh, You're the guy. You're the I, lunatic. I'm the lunatic. <laughs> I said to the lawyer, when we talked about not-for-profit, mm -hmm. I said, you know, it's not a thing that they're doing. It's not-for-profit. What is it? She said, well, it, it's around. You could do it. But it takes a lunatic. Are you the lunatic? I said, I'm the lunatic. <laughs> I was the lunatic. You had to be. I had to yeah. be because I was so deeply motivated. You see, this was, you learn as you get as old as I am, the when is very important. Definitely. Yeah. Now, this was a when, when uh, there was some notice by serious people that serious plays were not being done or they have diminished considerably. And uh, I absorbed what I read, like there was an article in the New York Times, uh, and the headline was, The Plight of a Serious Play. Well, that influenced me. Then there was uh, Robert Bruce Stein, a serious critic, uh, saying about writing about the lack of serious plays. What are theaters doing that are opening up and they're no longer doing serious plays. So the word serious got to be significant, and yeah. it still is. Absolutely. Yeah. And to me, I have one of the, I carry a lot of quotes around, like mm -hmm. a priest or a rabbi who has quotes from. You're a from quote machine. Said, That's yeah. your thing. And so one of them is a quote from uh, George Bernard Shaw, in, in which he's was writing criticism before he wrote plays and before he was recognized as a serious, as an important writer. And uh, so he had, they published three years of his, his criticism uh, when he worked for newspapers in the London in the 1890s. Wow. So I devoured those criticisms because <laughs> they meant so much to me. And one really stuck. Yeah. Uh, it said, uh, the, the play is an entertainment, not a serious revelation of mankind to itself. Hmm. Still remember that all these years later. You use it. Yeah. I, I carry it around all the time because that's what it is. Right. And that's what... You could have humor. He also wrote, humor is serious business. Mm. Serious, a word corrupt in. And when you work on William Shakespeare, you're doing a serious writer. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and he, what, what has occurred to me as I've taught Shakespeare quite a bit in my classes, is he's dealing with you, human nature. And he said, one touch of nature makes the whole world kin. Mm, I uh, love that. What a great quote. Yeah, wow. So That's really a great quote. Definitely. So he wrote one time, and if you work on Shakespeare, you see, well, he's dealing with this aspect of human nature. Oh, with this character, this aspect. And this play is about this, about a serious work about human nature. He was very aware of that and caught on to that, I would say caught on. It was brilliant. Anyway, so, uh, well, I, got anyway, so I, I got involved with the fact that it's serious, mm -hmm. about being serious in the theater, and that it was too difficult to do if you did commercial. Right. Because the commercial is not, that, oh, it can be once in a while serious, but a theater, I wanted a theater devoted to it. So the only criterion was, is this worthwhile doing? Is this a serious revelation to humankind of itself? And that's what I based my whole theater on, and it ran for, I don't know how many years, 40 some odd years. It worked and out pretty well for you. It worked out, and it worked out in my classes too, because I could imbue that into my students, mm. and they feel the camaraderie 
based on what they absorbed from me. You had a lot of great students. Sam Ooh. Shepard, Richard Gere, Chris Cooper. I mean, the list goes on and on. You're, you impacted so many people. So when people watch this film, and if they aren't familiar with you, what do you want them to walk away thinking? They walk away thinking that uh, Wynne Hinman, hey, he led a, a worthwhile life. He made his serious contribution to mankind to itself. There you go. Perfectly said. Wynne, thank you so much for coming in. Really great to meet you, and congratulations on the film. Same here. All thank right. you. Thanks so much for tuning in, everybody. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down.